essentially what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, you could possibly say what, what doesn't kill you makes you live longer as well, because what we discovered first in yeast cells that you know you can make beer and bread out of, and eventually in animals and now in humans, we found that these enzymes that I mentioned earlier called the sirtuins, these are protectors in the body, and they do a lot of good things. They protect uh, cell identity, they repair DNA, they boost energy in the mitochondria, which you mentioned earlier. So we discovered that, but then what we realized in the 2000s was that these genes and the enzymes that are produced from them are turned on by uh, hormesis. And what that means is any anything that puts the body in a state of perceived adversity, right? You don't want to actually damage the body to be able to live longer and be healthy. You want to give the impression that times are going to be tough. So being hungry uh, during the day, exercising, these are all things that tell the sirtuin genes to come on and to protect the body. Um, there are some other things that I do, uh, such as go to the sauna and jump in cold water baths to try and stimulate and get my body out of its complacency. When we sit around all day, I'm, I'm at a standing desk, by the way, I've, for that reason. Uh, if we sit around all day and we don't exercise and we eat constantly, our defenses don't get turned on. We don't have hormesis. And resveratrol, which we talked about, I've called a xenohormetic molecule, which means hormesis that you get from other species, such as plants. So when plants are stressed, they make resveratrol and other molecules like it. And I have this theory and some evidence that when we eat those stressed plants, our body thinks that our food supply is running out and it will also have the benefits of dieting and exercise as well. I love that. So uh, the more stressed plants I eat, the less exercise I have to do. Is that what I'm hearing here today? <laughs> <laughs> right. Let, let your food be stressed so you don't have to be. Uh. Well, yeah, you know, a, a, an interesting aside, this uh, is not to talk about, I happen to have an olive oil that has 30 times more polyphenols of any olive oil, and the person who developed it is in the Moroccan desert, and he knew that great wines come from vines that are stressed. They're planted in rocks, they're underwatered, uh, horrible conditions. And he says, you know, I bet you could do that with olives. So he found a rocky part of the Moroccan desert, underwatered them, and planted the vines right next to each, uh, the trees right next to each other, so they had to compete. And when he finally made the olive oil, uh, the French government found it had 30 times more polyphenols than any olive oil they had ever tested. And so you're right, uh, a, a stressed plant uh, gives more polyphenols and resveratrol is certainly one of those polyphenols. So uh, I think you're absolutely right on this. So yeah, so we're all gonna go out and eat stressed plants or stressed plant byproducts and that includes really good uh, red wine. Is, is that true or is that French paradox a total myth? Uh, I don't think it's a total myth, but the amounts of resveratrol that we find we have to give people uh, would be the equivalent of hundreds of glasses of red wine every day. Uh, work, 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 work. Yeah, the news just, <laughs> just keeps getting better and better, right? Uh, <laughs> but please don't don't overdrink. Uh, the alcohol is, of course, not, not helpful, and there's a lot of calories. Uh, that said, I I'm happy to entertain the possibility, and there's some there's some evidence from looking at populations that drinking a glass or two of red wine over 40 years can be beneficial. And there's not just resveratrol in red wine, there's quercetin and other things, as you know, Steve. Um, and so that cocktail with a bit of alcohol may be uh, responsible for some of those health benefits that we call the French paradox, where the French can eat a lot of cheese and fat and they don't have high rates of heart disease. No, I, yeah, I think that's very true, and like you say, and I say in all my books, look, if you don't drink, don't start. Uh, it's uh, rule number one, I think. Uh, what's one thing that uh, my listeners can do to stimulate hormesis for themselves? You've mentioned several of them. Yep. Come on, get, give us an easy one. All right. Well, so, so having read tens of thousands of papers and read your books, uh, and studied this for my whole life. If there's one thing that I could say that everybody needs to do, it's eat less often. Yeah. So that, yep. that's not malnutrition, not starvation. 
uh, please nobody uh, become underweight. But what this means is the three big meals a day with snacks in between, in my view, is ludicrous and has led us into a world of obesity. So I've recently, uh, well, actually most of my life I've skipped breakfast, but more recently tried to even skip lunch and then have a normal dinner. And it's been great for me. And we know in mice, if you, here's something that I'll leave everyone with before we take the break. Uh, I mentioned Rafa de Cabo down at uh, NIH, my good colleague down in Bethesda. He did a study that I think is a landmark. He mixed different types of, uh, different amounts of protein, fat, carbohydrate, and gave 10,000 mice different versions of a diet. And they all lived the same lifespan. The group that lived the longest was the group that gave, that had access to the food only two hours a day, which argues that it's not just what you eat, but when you eat, that's important. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, and whether we call it intermittent fasted or I, I like time-restricted feeding, which is kind of what you and I do, uh, you're, you know, you're an expert in this field. Would you please tell people why breakfast is not the most important meal of the day? Uh, well, so... I found, at least for myself, and I assume I'm an average person, uh, when I measure my blood sugar, so Steve, I've started measuring my, my blood sugar with a patch you can buy. Um, it's prescription only, but still, it's, I managed to convince one, one of my friends to let me try it. What I found is that I, and, and I've heard many others, their blood sugar goes up in the morning, and people like me are not hungry at all when we wake up. Um, and so it's, it's really force feeding um, for many of us. And I can do quite well without breakfast, and I don't need it. I'm actually I do much better physically and psychologically, mentally without breakfast. Uh, so I think for many people, having a breakfast is not just um, a waste of money. It's actually it's dangerous because it's a, it adds up the calories add add up fast. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, both our cortisol and our adrenaline levels rise in the morning, and that, of course, both uh, kick up blood sugar. And I take care of a large number of diabetics, many of whom have been on insulin. And one of the things they don't quite get is they always wake up with an elevated blood sugar, and they think it's because of what they ate the night before. And most of them, unfortunately, then say, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to eat some food, and that will bring my blood sugar down. Well, in fact, when they measure it again at 11, their blood sugar is down, and they make this connection mm -hmm. that the food brought it down. Well, it didn't. Uh, their cortisol and adrenaline fell normally. Uh, yeah, and as you know, uh, for the last now, this will be my 18th year, from January through June, I not only don't eat breakfast, but I don't eat lunch. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I'm a mouse at the NIH. Yeah. Uh, I eat all my calories in a two-hour window. Right. Um, and so far, so good. <laughs>